Can a game be good if it isn't fun? That's a question that a lot of people have been asking for a long time. It's a complicated question that admittedly causes a lot of people to groan since it's been talked to death over the years. Has it been 15 seconds yet? Let's add like another five more on there just to be safe. That feels about right. Man, fuck click holding. <laughs> I always find it difficult to recommend a game that makes me miserable. Do you know what I mean? A really easy example of this is The Last of Us Part Two. It's a fantastic game that's a meaningful exploration of grief and trauma that's packed to the brim with horrific violence, morally reprehensible acts, and giant farting zombies. It's probably one of the best games on the PS4 and I guess the PS5 for that matter go away. But when it comes to recommending it to people, I pause. It's not for everyone. It's really mature and heavy and not the kind of thing that I think most people would want to spend their time with as they unwind for the evening after a long day of work. That said, it made a really big impression on me because of just how unpleasant it was, which was the point, right? It was meant to be a reflection on violence and revenge. It would be weird if I wasn't affected by that. Let me know what your favorite tough to recommend games are in the comments below. I'm actually really curious what makes other people feel like that. I find miserable games to be fascinating. Games designed to make me and you and everyone else feel uncomfortable. Which is how I ended up with my hands on the most miserable game I might have ever played. Click holding. Clickholding is a game that I hated from the moment it started to the second it ended, so naturally I immediately played it again. It's fantastic at being horrifically off-putting and absolutely rotten to its core, which means that despite the fact that it made me deeply uncomfortable, I would heartily recommend it, with like a million asterisks. It's a game I found to be deeply agitating and unpleasant, but absolutely worth playing. As its title suggests, the game is an exploration of what you might call deviant sexual desires, with a clear connection to the word cuckolding, which I won't explain to you here out of fear of the YouTube demonetization hammer. Oh no! If you're not familiar, go ahead and do your own research. You might need an incognito tab. The premise of the game is extremely simple. You are voluntarily in a dingy hotel room holding a tally clicker, the kind of thing they use to keep track of attendance at water parks and things like that. And sitting in the corner of the room is a man wearing a horrific, inhuman-shaped mask with piercing, glowing eyes. He tells you to click the clicker 10,000 times, and if you do, he'll give you $14,000 and the game will be over. So you start clicking. Quickly after starting, the man starts making demands of you. Turn the TV on, open the shades, no, keep them closed. Turn around, don't look at me. Now come next to me and look me in the eyes. The man asserts total control and dominance over you. The relationship you have is one based on imbalance. Not only is he controlling your financial future, but very early on in the game, he starts waving a gun around before putting it back away. He wants you to know that he's in control and that he likes that you know that. Each of his demands feel perverse because you can tell that he's getting immense gratification, for lack of a better word, out of you doing them. You can't click the clicker until you've done what he's asked. Submission is not a choice, it's required to get the money. And it feels bad. As the number on your clicker gets higher, the man gets more and more agitated, talking with you about how wrong this all feels and how he wonders what his wife would say if she knew what he was doing. Clearly, he likes dwelling on how fucked up the entire thing is. Every so often, he lets out a big coughing fit or moves his hands in a new, disturbing way. There's not much to do inside the room, nothing to really see save for a handful of paintings on the walls, so you start to get really dialed into the man and his mannerisms, the perverse ways he finds enjoyment out of asserting himself over you. He tries to make small talk with you, but there's nothing that can distill the tension, nothing that cuts through the pretense of why you're both here. You can't help but stare at his mask, a mask he made based on a vivid dream. It took a long time to get right, he tells you, but it's still wrong. It's all fucked. 
The entire game made my skin crawl. There wasn't a stretch of longer than 30 seconds where I didn't have goosebumps up and down my arms. The hair on the back of my neck never laid flat. My body was in panic mode for the entire 30 minute experience. You start to rationalize with yourself as you get to higher numbers. Okay, we're at 3000, just about a third of the way through. There's not much left now. You say to yourself and you start clicking faster, but as your number gets higher and higher and the man gets more vocal and demanding of you, the tension rises as bigger events keep coming. You want to be at the end so badly. You want this entire thing to be over and for the game to end, but are petrified at the thought of what's coming next, of what will happen when you hit 10,000 and the clicker resets. Do I really want to be clicking this fast, sprinting towards an unknown event with the man in the mask? I'm not going to tell you what happens at the end of click holding. In fact, I fear that I'm showing you too much of the game already. Like I said, there's really not much to it other than what the man has to say to you and the feeling you get in the pit of your stomach as you listen to his voice. Well, perhaps calling it a voice is inaccurate. His sounds is maybe the thing to say. Clickholding's simplicity is what makes it so genius and sinister, and the man's voice is a fantastic example of that. He doesn't speak, there isn't any voice acting in the game, but when he talks, he lets out this low growl. You know what he's saying because of the text on screen, but his performance is entirely up to your imagination. The man's vocal portrayal is created entirely by inference. I know what he says, and I'm given a tone for how he says it, but my brain picks it up and fills in the blanks. It's more effective than if he was fully voiced because my brain just makes it scary instead of depending on an actor who might not totally sell it for everyone. I just assume in my head that he has the scariest voice imaginable. Every part of the terror of clickholding is based on inference. When the man asks you to turn around and not look at him while you click, you ask yourself about the million reasons why he might be telling you to do it. Is it shame? Is he doing something he doesn't want me to see? What would that be? Is he looking at me? If you turn around to see what he's doing, he raises his voice at you. You will not disobey him. My mind is filling in the blanks and it's terrifying. The fear-inducing inferences continue as you sit with your own thoughts in the room. Why wear the mask? What does he look like under the mask? What are the stains on his shirt from? Why doesn't he blink? What's going to happen when I reach the next clicker milestone? The man is always looking at you, and as time goes on, it feels like he's actually looking at you, playing the game. I don't want to spoil anything here, but there are lines of dialogue where clickholding makes it clear that there's some level of voyeurism going on between the man in the mask and you, the player. He likes to look at me, not whatever faceless avatar I'm controlling. Even once you exit the game, his unblinking eyes don't disappear, they just get bigger as they take up the majority of the space on its Steam page. Fuck this game. I heartily recommend clickholding. A twist, I know. That dissonance might be tough to understand though, depending on how you view games. Video games are an entertainment medium, but is that all they are? No, of course not. They're art, and what does art do? It makes you feel things. More often than not, games are made to make you feel satisfied with their engagement loops. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, as a game, is about managing your party's abilities to beat up giant monsters. Star Wars Outlaws is about sneaking around and shooting stormtroopers. These things feel satisfying to do, so the emotion they're trying to elicit is enjoyment. That's what most games are trying to get you to feel. Even The Last of Us Part II, to bring it back, ultimately wants you to have fun during the combat sections. Otherwise, they wouldn't make it so satisfying to properly do and then crowbar in a roguelike mode to the PS5 re-release. It's not all about doom and gloom. Most games want players to have fun and walk away feeling good. But that's not the only emotion that an interactive experience can solicit. There are a lot of games designed to make you miserable. Games like Darkest Dungeon, Fear and Hunger, and Pathologic are all made to get you to think about the ways that they make you miserable. To me, they're often the types of games that I have the most strong feelings about because they made me confront emotions other than joy. Clickholding is not fun, it's terrible. But it's an exploration of feeling terrible, feeling used and abused, and it's fantastic at doing that. I opened this video by asking if a game needs to be fun to be good, which is an age-old video game debate, but to me, 
It's really simple if you look at games as art. No, art does not need to be fun to be good, because art is meant to make us confront the full range of human emotions. That said, the most popular art, and by extension the most popular games, are usually not going to try and make you feel like you need to take a shower as soon as you're done with them. But that's just because people generally like feeling good. We like happy endings, we like winning and feeling like we've accomplished something. But there's not always much catharsis in that for me. People talk a lot about intentional friction in games, or to put it another way, design elements that are made for people to have bad experiences with. There was a lot of discussion about design friction when Dragon's Dogma 2 came out earlier this year with its obtuse and frequently punishing mechanics. Like we've talked about, feeling bad is not something that everyone wants to experience when they sit down with the game, which is understandable. So it's a tall order for game designers to find the right balance between a game's intentionally rough edges and smoothing everything over to the point where the game lacks any challenge and by extension, any reward. The real tough thing about that concept is that everyone is going to feel differently about how much friction they can handle in order to have fun. In my opinion, it takes a very brave studio to boldly say, I actually don't care if you have fun because that's the point of what we're making. On the other hand of that though, the studio then has to accept if people aren't interested in playing their game. It's so bold because making an intentionally niche game that pushes back against players automatically reduces the amount of people who will want to buy it. It's no wonder then that so many AAA studios are so risk averse when looking at the number of sales they need to make to just break even. H Bomber Guy voices this exact push and pull in his video about Pathologic where he says, And ultimately the game is what you get out of it. And for some people the line of what makes a game good is very far away from anything any version of this game is doing. It's completely understandable why some people don't engage with the game or want to and bounce off it. I certainly did that the first two times, so I can respect that. Like I said, it's not fun. Strange Scaffold, the studio behind Clickholding, understands that the types of games it makes won't be for everyone, which is something of a double-edged sword. On one hand, it means that the studio needs to accept that its games likely won't be huge blockbuster hits raking in millions. On the other side of that, it means that games like Clickholding or Life Eater, a game about stalking, kidnapping, and murdering your neighbors, are able to be made with lower sales expectations and on a smaller budget, which means less pressure. I reached out to Xelavier Nelson Jr., studio head at Strange Scaffold, which, side note, one of the cool things about playing indie games is that if you know how to reach a dev on social media, you just ask them about the game and they'll usually be pretty candid about things. If you've ever had questions about how games get made, I'd recommend asking your favorite indie creators. In my experience, they're often more than happy to talk about how it all works. Anyway, I asked Xelavier Nelson Jr. about how creating a game with a hyper niche audience impacted its development cycle. He said, for niche art to exist, it needs to be built in conditions that accommodate and ideally uplift the ability to create in that niche. So we didn't make click holding for 250K, wouldn't have received funding and therefore wouldn't exist. We made it for 25k. It's an infinitesimal budget in typical game development terms, but the one that allowed this project to exist. In a similar regard, if you have a game with an audience of 10 people, as long as you don't spend any more time or money than you need to survive to build that game for those 10 people, then the game becomes worth making. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about mass appeal for strange scaffold games. I don't begin production on a game unless I feel it needs to be made. If it doesn't have the strength of vision to be someone's next favorite game, we don't make it. Is Clickholding my new favorite game? No. But it's one that's stuck with me, a game that I keep turning over in my mind like a coin, revisiting its most uncomfortable moments in between thinking about much more pleasant things. Like I said, it's a game I heartily recommend if you have the stomach for examining the heavy content it examines. But here's the thing. Not everyone is going to be interested in what it has to say because of how awful it feels, and as we just talked about, that's fine. In an article on The Gamer, represent, Tessa Carr played the game, understood what it was trying to say and why, and walked away from the game hoping to never return to it. What I think is important to recognize when talking about miserable games like Clickholding is that Tessa's understanding and opinion of the game is just as valid as someone who played it, hated it, as intended, and walked away wanting to explore it further. I asked Xelavier what he thought about negative reviews from people like that, and he said, I don't get frustrated when people have an unpleasant time with our projects. Not every game is for every person, and that's okay. 
The only thing I find personally frustrating is when people get upset at a game for not being what they think it should be, rather than judging it by the standards of what it's attempting to do and whether it accomplishes that goal. You know what the final and most interesting thing about clickholding and other intentionally awful experiences? At the top, we talked about fun and if a game needs to be fun to be good, but that's such a moving target of meaning. Like, was clickholding fun? Is it really that far off from other simple horror games like Five Nights at Freddy's? I'm not so sure. In fact, I think there are a lot of parallels between the two. Both are bite-sized indie experiences created with the explicit intention of freaking you out and doing nothing more. Was that the bite of 87? I'd say that clickholding is a bit more of a thinker than FNAF, but when you boil them down, they're really similar. But a lot of people consider Five Nights at Freddy's to be a fun game, while I'm not so sure that's the general consensus from the people who've played clickholding. Tessa Carr certainly didn't think so, and I'm not sure I do either. Fun and the idea of enjoyment is such an interesting thing to me, especially when games intentionally push back on the idea of what that even means. A lot of people like dwelling on those emotions, like we talked about with FNAF, but even with clickholding, there are people finding fun in places that I just wouldn't even think to go. Like, there's a very small, and I mean very small, clickholding speedrun community. The current world record, by the way, is 24 minutes and 35 seconds. I bet they're having fun with the game. Zalavier left me by saying this. I think every game, even if it's not strictly fun, should be compelling and make a case for why you are spending a portion of your limited time on this earth playing this game out of any game. To a degree, that's my definition of fun. So I find clickholding fun. It fucks you up, it traps you in a room with it, literally, and gives you space to feel. And it doesn't overstay its welcome before letting you out into the world to experience something else. So making a game that's explicitly seen as fun is not a goal of every project I direct, but don't be surprised if another strange scaffold game grabs you by the shirt and refuses to let go at some point. Do I recommend clickholding? Absolutely. It's gripping and tense and made me ask myself repeatedly what it was trying to say. Any game that does that for me gets my seal of approval, and it's got me eagerly awaiting the next thing that Strange Scaffold has cooking up, which might actually be out by the time this video goes live. With clickholding, you go on this journey. It starts out as fuck this forever, and then once it's done, you walk away saying, it was actually brilliant. Was clickholding fun? I'm still not sure, but I know that the definition of fun is going to vary from person to person. Let's just say this. The three people who wrote clickholding fan fictions on AO3 definitely had some fun. I react just in time to stop my hand, inches away from feeling the rough material of his jeans, the firmness of him below the clothes. His breath swash over your face, somehow hotter than even this trapped room. I edge my hand closer to him. The clicker with it I gently lay my hand on his thigh as I scoot closer. It's so humid you can feel the sweat clinging to your skin, see it pooling in beads on his throat and in spreading condensation on his gun. Your eye level with his and his trousers are with to the point of I don't know if it was the game or the fan fiction, but I feel like I need to go take a shower. Like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>